games anime, and I'm a forester in the fourth generation of the Starker family. The Starker Forest started in 1936 by my great-grandfather, T.J. Starker, and it's been in the family ever since, joined my grandfather, Bruce, and my dad and uncle, Bart and Vaughn, and now me and my brother and a couple of my cousins are also involved with it. The Starker Lecture Series started as a way to honor T.J as well as Bruce, because they're both really interested in forums for debate and new ideas in forestry. After they both passed away, the family thought it would be a good way to carry on their legacy. Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Tom DeLuca, I'm the Dean of the College of Forestry, and I welcome you to the 2021 Starker Lecture Series. Before we get started, I just wanted to take a moment to acknowledge that Oregon State University in Corvallis, Oregon, is located in the traditional homelands of the Mary's River or Ampinifu Band of the Kalapuya. Following the Willamette Valley Treaty of 1855, the Kalapuya people were forcibly removed to reservations in Western Oregon. Today, living descendants of these people are part of the Confederated Tribes of the Grand Ronde community of Oregon and the Confederated Tribes of the Silitz Indians. <clears throat> the Starker Lectures were established in 1985 by the Starker family to commemorate the lives and professional contributions of TJ and Bruce Starker. These visionaries were both graduates of the College of Forestry at OSU. As a matter of fact, TJ was the, in the first graduating class of the uh, then Oregon Agricultural College, the first graduating class in forestry of the Oregon Agricultural College and became one of the college's first professors. TJ uh, lived what he taught and began purchasing cutover forest lands around Corvallis. In time, these lands became the Starker Forest, a family forestry enterprise that exemplifies the very best of private family forest operations in the state and likely in the nation. During the past 36 years, Starker lectures have challenged our thinking about a wide range of topics from local to global scale. Many have been controversial, generating needed dialogue about managing our landscapes. All have been stimulating and thought provoking, exactly what a university distinguished lecture series should be. The theme of the 2021 Starker lecture series is resilience in the face of disturbance, learning from disasters. Natural disturbances and disasters have a long history of presenting opportunities for society to learn, adapt and thrive. The multiple disasters that have and challenges that have faced us this last year have proven the need for society to be resilient, learn and adapt to new realities. Whether dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic or the devastating wildfires this past year has forced us all to overcome and look at new ways to live and work. This year's Starker Lecture Series focuses on how communities, industries and organizations across forest landscape can uh, have responded to recent and previous disasters, shown resilience in the face of adversity, and are ready to play a critical role in creating a better future for us all. The four-part pa uh, panel series will focus on forest economics, recreation, education, and research. The series will provide insight into the difficulties of the past year the issues we might face in the future, and what we can do to ensure a better future for ourselves, the organizations we work for, and the communities where we live. It's now my pleasure to introduce, introduce Ashley D'Antonio, Assistant Professor and Starker Letter, Lecture Committee member who will lead our panel on recreation. Ashley? Thank you so much for that great introduction to this 
Darker Lecture Series, Tom. Today's first panel will focus on recreation and disturbance. So in the past year, the COVID-19 pandemic and wildfires have impacted outdoor recreation systems, both in the United States and around the world. These disturbances can influence how people recreate, where people recreate, and the impact of behavior of visitors to parks and protected areas. Such changes in recreation use and related impacts to natural systems can lead to challenges for outdoor recreation managers. So the panel today will take both a local and a global view of how these natural disturbances and disasters have affected recreation systems and how outdoor recreation managers can respond. We have a set of four panelists today. I'll introduce them briefly now and then in more detail as they present. Um, we have Ben Lahan from Leave No Trace Center for Outdoor Ethics, Kaylin O'Brien Feeney from Oregon's Office for Outdoor Recreation, Nicoletta Jones from the University of Cambridge in the UK, and Catherine Pickering from Griffith University in Australia. Throughout the presentations, you're welcome to put questions in the Q&A. We will save our Q&A for the end after all the panelists have given their presentations, but again, you can enter your questions at any time. And with that, I would like to introduce our first panel presenter, Ben Lahan. Ben Lahan is a seasoned conservation professional with deep commitment to environmental protection. Oops, sorry, lost my screen. <laughs> ben Lahan is a seasoned conservation professional with deep commitment to environmental protection through education, partnership, public and private collaboration, and stewardship of natural resources. He joined the Leave No Trust Center for Outdoor Ethics in 2001 where he serves as Director of Education and Research. His current responsibilities include research, curriculum development, natural resource and visitors management consulting, agency relations, management of national education and training programs, and oversight of national outreach efforts. Previously, he worked as the Associate Regional Representative for the Appalachian Trail Conservancy in Asheville, North Carolina. He has also worked as an American Canoe Association whitewater kayak and swift water rescue instructor. Ben has served on numerous national and regional nonprofit boards, and he has a Bachelor's of Science in Natural Resources from the University of Tennessee, and a Master's of Science in Human Dimensions of Natural Resources from Colorado State University. And Ben is an avid outdoor enthusiast. So you can take it away, Ben. Thanks, Ashley. I appreciate the introduction. I would just like to um, say that Leave No Trace acknowledges the lands that we enjoy through our outdoor activities and that they are the traditional ancestral lands of indigenous people and nations. Our intention with this acknowledgement is to honor the cultural ways of stewarding the land uh, practiced from ancient times to today. So with that, I'm gonna share my screen and we'll get started here. So what I'm gonna be talking about today is uh, some research that we at the Leave No Trace Center conducted uh, starting last spring, at essentially at the outset of the pandemic with our academic partner, one of our academic partners, Penn State University. And we were interested in looking at a rapid assessment of how COVID was changing recreation trends um, in the US. And that was really the intention of this specific um, study. Our goal was to collect timely and relevant data on national trends. We were looking at pre-COVID, during COVID, and hoping to be able to predict trends in a post-COVID world, which we're still not quite there yet. But this is our goal at the outset, because we, we could tell uh, at Leave No Trace, we work across the US with land management agencies from local, municipal, to state, to federal. And we were hearing about and seeing an increase in visitation and impacts as a result of more and more people on the landscape. So we really wanted to see the, what the influence of COVID was on this. So our goal was to specifically be able to offer guidance regarding these trends to our land management partners, to recreation providers, even to the general public in terms of what can you expect when you go somewhere to recreate in a time of COVID. So the methodology for this, we essentially, given the time frame and the speed at which we were trying to conduct this assessment, we were able to use a sample of known individuals through the Leave No Trace Center's database, which we had about 65,000 contacts that we started with in terms of active outdoor enthusiasts. These are people that recreate um, as much as four to five days per week in some fashion in the outdoors. I should mention that our sample was not a nationally representative sample of the United States. Though we had thousands of people participate, it was a sample of active outdoor enthusiasts. Um, again, these were known contacts that we had from the Leave No Trace Center. Uh, we facilitated this survey online using the Qualtrics platform. 
we did three phases of data collection. We did this over a nine week period in order to have a little bit more of a longitudinal picture of how trends might be changing given how quickly things were evolving uh, in the spring of 2020 with COVID. And our intention was to have more of this longitudinal perspective, even though it was only nine weeks. Um, but it did give us some a sense of how things were evolving fairly rapidly uh, due to the pandemic. Here you can see the study schedule. So we, one of the things that we were very intentional about was tracking, um, at least here in the US, tracking the days since the pandemic have been declared by the World Health Organization, the confirmed number of cases in the US and the confirmed number of COVID deaths in the US. So you can see here phase one was um, early April. We ran each of these surveys for a 48 hour window. So we wanted to have a very tight snapshot in time, uh, both in terms of the, the declaration of the pandemic, the days since that occurred, and then of course the confirmed cases and deaths. So you can see our second phase was late April. Our third phase was the third week in May. And you can see how the numbers of course changed in terms of time uh, from the start of this data collection until the end in terms of the days since the pandemic was declared and certainly the numbers of confirmed cases and such. So this is the representation of the spatial distribution from our phase one sample. And as I indicated, not a nationally representative sample, a sample of active outdoor enthusiasts. We created these sort of heat maps for each phase of the research and they were largely essentially the same um, in terms of responses. Um, and so I'm only gonna show phase one just for brevity here, but this gives you a sense of where we were getting responses um, in terms of uh, individuals throughout the country. In phase one, what was really interesting is we, as we combed through the data, we started to see trends emerging where there were some key findings for land managers. And there were also some key findings for just the general public. So you can see here on the left, the time frame of the survey, the sample size, we had over a thousand people participate in our confidence interval. And one of the things that we found initially was that, and this was somewhat intuitive, but people were going out more uh, alone more often. So since the pandemic was declared, people were recreating by themselves, whereas previously they'd been spending time with more people. We also saw that people were staying closer to home. People were indicating that they were uh, traveling two miles or less from their home to recreate. And this was a, an interesting trend that popped out. As, as, as we also had lockdowns and closures and various things, we still saw that people wanted to get out. They're more comfortable going by themselves and they want to stick close to home. We also saw that um, in this first phase, people indicated they were not necessarily gonna wait for the risk of COVID to completely go away before continuing to spend time outside. For, you know, they wanted to continue to recreate for both the mental and physical health benefits. And uh, as long as they felt like they could stay by themselves and close to home, there was a sense that they could be relatively safe. We also asked in phase one, if these individuals thought that these patterns were likely here to stay. And we started to see that about nearly 40% of our sample said, yes, we feel like that these changes to the way we recreate may be here to stay for the long term. And it's a really interesting finding from phase one. The, the general public findings um, from phase one were really more about, um, we were really interested in what's motivating the decisions people are making to spend time outside. And so we found where um, personal protective measures, health measures, um, and specific guidelines from trusted entities like the World Health Organization, the Center for Disease Control, uh, state and local uh, health departments and so forth. That's where people were looking for good guidance for how to spend time outside safely. Again, there was a sense that these behaviors and changes would be here to stay. Um, when we look at phase two, you can see just a few changes uh, to that map. I, I, again, phase three is really essentially a repeat of this. Uh, but we broadened the distribution just a bit, but again, not entirely a nationally representative sample. We did ask a few different questions. We were curious about people's employment. We wanted to know if that was a variable in either increased recreation or changes in patterns. And you can see here, 60% of our sample were employed, 40% not working, but only 15% indicated that they were not working as a result of the pandemic. We also ask about the personal impacts of COVID that these people might've experienced, thinking that if you knew someone who was diagnosed or you knew someone who um, had passed away or was hospitalized, there, that could potentially influence your recreation pattern. So you can see here, um, we had a number of people who personally knew someone within their community, 32% knew someone with COVID, 11% um, knew someone who had actually died of COVID. Um, and we also saw where 
Um, some people suspected they personally had COVID. And so we were curious about the interaction of these variables in terms of recreation patterns. So at phase two, um, again, a 48 hour window, we had just under a thousand responses or so. We had 47 different states that uh, with people that, from those states that participated. And what we saw that was interesting in phase two was that people were expecting land management agencies to limit capacity. Um, generally speaking, we don't always see where individuals will ask land managers to limit capacity or limit their freedom or their access to parks protected areas. This is an interesting finding from this second phase, and it was largely motivated by a desire to ensure uh, adequate physical distancing. Uh, we also saw where outdoor enthusiasts, recreationists really felt like that the public land management agencies had a duty to, to more um, comprehensively promote physical distancing. And lastly, we saw in this second phase where uh, people were unsupportive of opening their communities to tourists without some restrictions. Uh, this, you know, as the situation was fluid and changing, people were saying, we're not sure we're ready for outsiders to come into our communities. We moved into phase three. This is the third and final phase. You can see over the three phases, we had about 2,600 participants. Um, there was some overlap. We did ask if you had previously participated in any of the uh, uh, prior surveys. And so we have those data. And I'll give you a link here if you're interested in looking at all of these data beyond just these infographics. But this third phase uh, was really trying to get a handle on what we might expect moving forward. We started to see where people were getting back to their normal dosage of nature. People were saying, okay, I'm starting to feel a little more comfortable. Masks are the standard. Um, we're starting to get a handle on how we can move about and go about uh, recreating safely. We also saw where um, recreationists were be basing their decisions about recreation specifically on personal health motivations, so mental and physical health benefits, as well as clear communication from those trusted sources like the CDC, Center for Disease Control, and so forth. Um, and again, we ask about this um, notion of long-term changes to behavior, and that continued to be a salient finding here as people are saying, yes, because of COVID, I have either found new trails in my neighborhood that I had never hiked or new bike routes or, or other areas where I can spend time outside and still achieve the things I want to achieve, but they're close to home. And so this is an interesting finding in terms of what recreation might look in years to come or might look like in years to come. So some key findings here. The frequency of outdoor recreation increased throughout the study period, indicating people were more comfortable getting back to that normal dosage of recreation. We also saw where the distance from home began to increase. People started to feel more comfortable about traveling a little further from their home to spend time in the outdoors. One interesting thing that we saw in phase one was a real uptick in use of, of neighborhood and city streets for recreation. And we also saw where urban populations were heavily affected by lockdowns because they, in many cases, have fewer recreational opportunities in an urban space. And when you're under lockdown, it just makes it that much harder to get outside. So we saw a big spike in things like uh, use of city and neighborhood streets. We saw a spike in things like gardening and people's yards. We started to see these things decrease as we got to phase three, indicating that people are starting to get back to some of these pre-pandemic patterns. We also saw where, again, um, respondents in phase two and three were more likely to perceive these long-term changes to these recreation patterns. And I think that that trend may continue to hold. I'm not certain about that, but that's just a sort of a gut feeling that I have about this. Um, the overarching implications, it's clear that parks and protected areas provide you know, physical health, mental health benefits. This is certainly heightened during COVID and just a number of people who are seeking those benefits from our, our shared lands. Um, recreation uh, participation, we still think that it's likely to remain high. I mean, we've seen a somewhat of a slowdown because of the winter season here in the U.S., but I would say as the weather starts to get nice in many parts of the country, we will probably continue to see an uptick in people spending time outdoors. There are a lot of people who were new to the outdoors, and they realize now how wonderful uh, these parks and protected areas we have are, and so they may continue using those. That said, these patterns are likely to shift over time. I mean, as COVID starts to, continues to evolve and vaccines continue to um, uh, prove to be effective and so forth, we're likely to see people revert back to things they were doing pre-COVID. Um, also, uh, you know, this notion of information from trusted sources continues to be a critical piece. People are asking not only land managers, but health professionals how to stay safe. They still wanna know this information. 
we do currently have one peer reviewed publication that's out in the Journal of Urban Ecology. And this really looked at how um, these changes um, across urban and rural communities really affected people in different ways. Um, I would encourage you to take a look at this article if you're interested. Uh, as I mentioned though, we do have a, a report from each of the three phases of research on the Leave and Trace website, as well as those infographics you saw and the journal article is available there as well. So a couple of things, this was self-reported. It was retrospective data. We were asking people to think pre-pandemic designation by the World Health Organization and then post-pandemic designation. So there are some limitations there. Uh, we also were limited in some ways by the lack of information regarding state-specific stay-at-home or lockdown orders. We just, it, they were changing so quickly during that nine week period that we couldn't track it state by state. Uh, and so that could be uh, another limitation. In terms of future research, we're really still curious about the specific aspects of the pandemic that led to those patterns. And so we're, we're digging into some, some methodologies where we could really start to get at that. We also want to conduct ongoing research looking at these patterns. So the team that worked on this last spring is convening next week to discuss a follow-up study so we can have some year-over-year -year comparative data. So we're still very interested in how this is affecting public lands. But also, we know there's a silver lining to this. More people are enjoying the outdoors, and that's always a good thing, particularly if we can, can give them good information about doing so responsibly. So with that said, uh, I'm done. I think we're saving questions for the end. Ashley, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, yeah, but I'm going to go ahead and stop my screen. Yep. Thank you, Ben. That's correct. If you have questions for Ben, um, please feel free to put them in the chat and I'll refer to them at the end when we do our panel wide Q&A. Um, but thank you so much, Ben, for that really interesting presentation about, about the survey um, and your findings. We're going to move on to our next panelist. Um, that will be Kaylin O'Brien Feeney. Kaylin has served as the first director of Oregon's Office of Outdoor Recreation since 2018. And in that role works to elevate the personal community and economic benefits of outdoor recreation for all Oregonians. A graduate of Lewis and Clark College and the University of Idaho, he previously developed the Outdoor Industry Association State and Local Advocacy Program. Um, was policy director for Winter Wildlands Alliance, led trips for the National Outdoor Leadership School, also called Knowles, guided on rivers around the West, among other jobs during a career that's always been in the outdoors or for the outdoors. Thanks, Ashley. Um, I will go ahead and start my screen share. There we go. Um, yeah, so thanks for inviting me into the Starker lecture series today, uh, following Ben providing those high level and research backed themes. What I wanted to provide um, is a little bit more of an Oregon and practitioner's perspective over the last year, touching on uh, some outdoor recreation trends themselves, uh, context around outdoor recreation in Oregon, uh, a little bit of behind the curtain, um, how, how recreation has been managed in the state over the last, you know, almost a year at this point between both COVID-19 and in response to wildfires. And, and then some of the strategies that are really seeing support galvanized around them moving forward. Um, so I'll start just with uh, a, a bit of background. And I only have a couple slides here to provide um, a bit of a sort of a roadmap to what I want to share. Um, and, and this, as I said, is not as much research-based um, over the last year as I want to help folks understand, um, you know, sort of contextualize some of the experience that they likely uh, have had out there. So some of the past research that's been done, uh, some of which was has been in partnership with Oregon State University, we know that um, essentially, outdoor recreation is already tremendously popular in Oregon and that it's a huge contributor to both quality of life and our state's economy. Uh, we also know that even before the pandemic or this last historic wildfire season in Oregon, that in many ways um, there were supply and demand issues, uh, there were equity issues, and there were, there were maintenance challenges that in some ways, the popularity of outdoor recreation in Oregon has um, for some time been 
outstripping our ability to, to manage it and maintain, man, maintain uh, outdoor recreation infrastructure in, in some places. And so, you know, I have a couple of sort of high level facts here um, that uh, according to the statewide comprehensive outdoor recreation plan that was released in 2019, uh, that 95% of Oregonians from a recent, I guess, three years ago, now a statewide survey participated in some form of outdoor recreation, whether that be hunting, fishing, motorized, non-motorized sports, wildlife watching, kind of um, neighborhood walks, anything that runs the gamut. And then spoke to some of the changes that we saw during COVID. I experienced those personally, and I heard about them from many local, state, um, federal, and, and private recreation providers as well. Uh, outdoor recreation is a huge part of Oregon's economy, both in urban and rural areas, uh, supporting 224,000 full and part-time jobs. Um, that is from a, a study released just uh, two weeks ago based on 2019 data, so pre-pandemic, and that will serve as a baseline going forward. We commissioned Earth Economics, a consulting firm, um, in partnership with Travel Oregon and the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife to, to get a handle on outdoor recreation's economic contribution for folks that are interested. That report does provide information down to the county level as well as tourism district level. Um, as Ben mentioned as well, uh, there are tremendous health and, and wellness benefits of time spent in the outdoors. This next stat there is just a little bit more context, um, again, produced in partnership with Oregon State University, showing that in 2018, uh, the cost of illness savings, the avoided cost of um, illnesses from physical activities in the outdoors was 1.4 billion, which is um, around 3% of total healthcare spending in the state. And then I put down there at the bottom, just a, a few different deferred maintenance uh, statistics to back up the, the claim that I made to start that in, in some ways, while the increase in outdoor recreation has happened, funding hasn't necessarily always come along with it. And that was really heightened this last year. So with that as context, I'm just gonna dive into um, a little bit of what probably everyone uh, attending this lecture series in, in some form or fashion experienced over the last year. And as I said, a, a little bit of the background of how these management decisions were made along the lines of some of those goals of providing good public information, of providing outdoor recreation experiences in given some of the constraints that, that we had over this last year with both COVID-19 and wildfires. So in the, you know, in the spring period, a similar period to uh, the study period that Ben spoke to, there were you know, widespread park closures. Um, there were public health measures put in place by Governor Brown, um, sort of echoed across the state by um, different managing entities as we tried to get a handle on essentially how to both protect the public and uh, staff in a, a very new pandemic at that point. And that resulted in a series of closures um, in the spring that folks will remember. In order to, to reopen many of those you know, parks, public lands, and other outdoor recreation sites, um, the Office of Outdoor Recreation was responsible for really convening um, local other state agencies. My office is a division of the Oregon Parks and Recreation Department, um, where most of these photos are called from, um, or as most Oregonians would know, Oregon State Parks. But we worked with local agencies, uh, other state agencies, the U.S. Forest Service, Bureau of Land Management, National Park Service, Army Corps of Engineers, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, et cetera, et cetera, to sort of collaboratively get our, our heads around how to um, recommend workable guidance uh, in concert with the governor's office and Oregon Health Authority, uh, how to produce messaging that would help folks understand what was open and closed and some of the, beha the behavior changes that we were seeking and that level of collaboration between uh, different outdoor recreation entities in Oregon extended beyond the agencies to include work with nonprofit partners, 
with businesses such as outfitters and guides or ski areas with uh, local elected leaders so that we had as comprehensive of, of a picture and good open lines of communication as possible. And uh, I won't, I'll just be completely honest that of course that was that was really challenging. One of the sort of root motivations behind our collaborative approach to managing through the pandemic was uh, a basic assumption that many folks think about the experience that they want to have in the outdoors, a uh, picnic with their family, a uh, hike to a waterfall, something like that. They think about the, the place either that they live or that they want to visit first and second or third or somewhere further down the line who, who the land manager is. And you also have a dynamic where if you can imagine, for example, a state park adjacent to a county park or a piece of federal public land, um, if one of those places is open and the other isn't, or vice versa, or if they have different rules, um, that's gonna create confusion when we're asking for some pretty big behavior changes. A few of those are, are listed under J.R. Bieber there on the slide, um, reinforcing physical distancing, um, sanitation, hand washing, uh, use of a face covering, and you know, we, we did reopen, not all at once, but sort of after having conversations both amongst ourselves as public land management entities, as well as with those local leaders about their own level of readiness. So the agencies really followed um, local communities in saying whether they were ready or not um, for outdoor recreation access, it, first day use and then overnight use to reopen again. And I won't go through all of the, the data, some of it's still being crunched for 2020, um, but we did see a huge shift in, in use patterns and different data, both industry, as well as some, some interesting trackable data showing um, that yes, outdoor recreation use was up in, in many places, not always, but in addition to increased frequency, we saw um, times of the day or days of the week that were busy, that were not previously busy. We saw, for example, a huge surge in the interest in hunting and fishing. Um, the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife recorded 172,000 more hunting and fishing license sales last year than in 2019. Um, I, I could go on, but folks would probably just think back to any sunny summer weekend trying to go outside. And anecdotally, um, whether it's you know crowding on a on a trailhead or a bridge like I have a photo of there at Smith Rock State Park, or seeing the result of you know reduced services in, in many places, there were challenges out there on the ground, no doubt. And so I, I want to just give voice to why some of those challenges um, were experienced, and you had essentially increased use. Um, layered on to sort of reduced access in some places. And some of that reduction in access was simply a function of fewer staff and reduced budgets being available because of some of the economic fallout related to COVID-19 for actually managing on the ground use. So that made it just that much more incumbent on us to um, keep lines of communication open and to develop tools and resources to help uh, inform the public all of which was very new, but the, the collaboration has been strong, very, very, very strong throughout. And, you know, many of those same themes of um, open lines of communication and collaboration amongst agencies because of the nature of the impacts extended through um, to both the on the ground impacts from the 2020 fire season, as well as how we're approaching recovery from that fire season with re respect to communications, um, you know, shared assessments of recreation impacts and that idea of recreation displacement that I spoke to you before, that if, if one place is closed, um, a lot of that use might find its way somewhere else. And so I'm gonna finish just by talking about a couple of these key strategies that we've settled on essentially moving forward and um, happy to take questions to go into detail or share more examples in the end, but it's, it's a lot to, to try and wrap up at such a high level summary. So um, 
these are the, the strategies that have kind of risen to the top, at least for me, in terms of how I'm working with partners and other agencies in supporting outdoor recreation statewide. Um, the, the first is a real focus on uh, having equity principles at the core of our work moving forward in terms of reinvestments, in terms of uh, helping communicate and ensure that folks uh, of all backgrounds and abilities feel welcome in the outdoors, and we have a long way to go there, but it's um, become abundantly clear, uh, just as one example, that you know, asking folks to stay local and recreate you know, in their neighborhood or out their door isn't, isn't possible. It's, it's inequitable in different places in Oregon. Um, so there's, there's a gap to be made up there and, and some legislation currently being considered in this 2021 legislative session to address and advance that, that principle introduced by both legislators and at the request of Governor Brown. Um, we need to double down um, on our educational sort of work and our communications tools. Uh, hopefully folks will have seen some combination of uh, the Leave No Trace principles, uh, an Oregon specific toolkit that was developed really led by Travel Oregon, but a multi-agency partnership I'll take care out there, or perhaps they've seen this movement around hashtag recreate responsibly, which is a, a national coalition and similar messaging around helping folks to plan ahead and understand how outdoor recreation might look differently. Um, we've also invested time in, in mapping resources. Um, there was a development of a web-based tool called Park Pulse. The uh, URL is just parkpulse.io. Uh, that was developed in partnership between a uh, consulting firm in Portland who used their PPP grant funded time um, to essentially build an interagency recreation map that showed um, co COVID status um, as well as crowding potential at different areas. And it pulled in more than 7,000 different recreation sites from over uh, 400 different recreation providers on that one map, which is a new tool of its type. We're, we're doing a similar effort now around um, showing fire perimeters and open closed status of recreation sites. Uh, hopefully that'll be up and running before spring break. I've talked a bit about our shared planning and response functions, um, just the notion that you know, these lands bordering one another, um, those jurisdictional boundaries are, are sometimes less relevant to the recreating public than they are to land managers. And it's incumbent on us to help provide a, a seamless experience where possible. Um, there's also a huge role in providing community technical assistance and those shared planning resources in the context of fire recovery. And, and lastly, um, as we work through the pandemic and, and on wildfire recovery, um, as well as increased recreation use and interest, the need for investments both in staff and in people, as well as in places, hasn't gone away and in fact has only increased. Um, so that's what I have in terms of a presentation. I'll go ahead and, and stop sharing and look forward to the panel discussion at the end. Great, thank you so much, Kaylin. So we're gonna transition from moving from the United States to learning about some impacts in Europe. So our next presenter is going to be Dr. Nicoletta Jones. She is a principal research associate at the Department of Land Economy at the University of Cambridge. She leads a project Fidelio funded by the European Research Council starting grant that explores the social impacts of European protected areas. Dr. Jones has worked across various institutions in the past decades, including um, Angelia Ruskin University, the Open University, and the University of Birmingham. Dr. Jones is an environmental social scientist, and her work focuses mainly on social impacts of environmental policies and improving the levels of public accountability for policy initiative, public acceptability, excuse me, for policy initiatives. In recent years, she has become increasingly interested in assessing social impacts of protected areas, focusing on their temporal and spatial dimension. And Dr. Jones has also done research on the valuation of natural resources and environmental management of organizations. She has significant expertise in analyzing social data, mainly with quantitative and mixed methods techniques. And she's interested in the analysis of data focusing on temporal and spatial dimensions. 
And as a reminder, if you have questions at any point, please put them in the q and I may have said the chat earlier, and I apologize for any confusion. If questions go in the Q&A, we'll move to that at the end. And with that, I'll turn it over to you, Nicoletta. Thank you, Ashley. Thank you very much for the invitation. Um, I'll try to share my screen uh, just to get this out of the way. Um, okay. So uh, yeah, thank you very much. It, it has, it's, it's very interesting for me to be here today because I, we've been doing research on COVID in Europe, but we don't have a good feeling of what's going on around the world. So it's, it's uh, like an eye opener for me. Um, so as Ashley mentioned, I'm an environmental social scientist and my work is mainly about social impacts of protected areas. Uh, but when COVID happened, it became very clear that at least in Europe, where, where we, we are, um, that there were significant impact for the management uh, authorities of these protected areas. So we very quickly tried to um, do some research to understand what is the situation um, and how, what are basically the challenges that the management authorities are facing, facing and how we can help them. Um, so the um, just to put it in context, because I wasn't quite sure how many people know about the protected areas in Europe, I think they're a little bit different from the states. Um, so we have quite a lot of uh, designated areas um, as protected in Europe. We have all, over 120,000 sites. However, a lot of them are quite small. Uh, but the thing, something which is a little bit different from other areas is that in a lot of the parks we have in Europe, in a lot of the protected areas we have, people live within these designated areas. So people and nature kind of co coexist and management authorities have a very um, challenging, let's say, um, situation sometimes to manage. Um, also these protected areas often attract a significant number of visitors. Um, and there's a lot of movement um, between, you know, the different countries uh, that exist in Europe. So there are about 44 countries. Um, Obviously, we have the European Union, which includes some of these countries, and it's quite um, a significant um, um, the frameworks that are provided by the European Union do not influence just the countries that are part of the Union, but also the countries that often uh, are looking uh, are trying to get in the European Union. Um, obviously, we have the UK, which is the first country that has exited uh, the EU, but that's a different story. Um, so we have the Natura 2000 designations, uh, which are EU uh, designations, we have the Ramsar Convention, the Emerald Network, a lot of national parks, and then we have the regional parks, so there's a lot of overlap in the designations that exist. And we recently had the uh, publication of the new EU biodiversity strategy, where basically um, the EU has stated that they're going to try to protect 30% of land and 30% of sea by 2030. There is a significant emphasis on ecological restoration in this uh, strategy. And basically there is this idea that we have to make space uh, for nature. Um, so what happened when um, COVID hit Europe, as you know, uh, similar to the states, uh, the European Union has been, the, the Euro Europe has been quite, quite badly hit by um, the pandemic. We have, um, we had the first lockdown in spring, uh, last spring, so it started about a year ago, a little bit, about 11 months. Um, it was quite strict. Um, for example, there was a lot of limitations on how far you can travel. Um, in Wales, here in the UK, there was a five mile range that you could travel. Obviously, old school closed, there were social distancing measures. There were some uh, countries that had very strict restrictions. So for example, you couldn't even go out to exercise. Uh, with the only exception within the continent being Sweden that basically didn't adopt um, a very hard lockdown. Uh, it, 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 it had a little bit of a different approach. Um, but everything changed uh, as soon as the cases started going down, then we saw an easing of lockdown regulations, the traveling between countries um, started and the hospitality sector reopened. So that meant that people started again to visit uh, the different, you know, the various parks uh, around, around Europe. Um, 
Now, we um, decided to explore two main things about COVID and protected areas. The first one was how it has impacted local communities that live within protected areas. And we were very interested on, on this topic because we know that a lot of the communities that live within these areas rely a lot on visitors. Uh, so it was kind of, there was no evidence, but we kind of knew that probably the local economy has um, be, been impacted significantly. Um, and, and the second uh, aim was to understand how COVID-19 has impacted um, how the management authorities in the in the European protected areas have you know have coped with the challenges. So um, it was two different things that we were focusing on. Um, we did two workshops, one in July and one in October, where basically we invited management authorities from 14 uh, European parks. Now to put it into context, this is not uh, in a in a representative sample. It was more like a qualitative research that we can go in depth and understand a little bit better the challenges that the parks are facing. Um, so in Europe, uh, we have over 400 uh, national parks. So this is a very small sample, but at least it gives us an idea of uh, what's going on in some of the countries. And then we have also done three online surveys uh, using also Qualtrics like Ben um, in three parks, one in Wales, one in England, and one in Germany. And one more is being, um, uh, currently distributed in, in, the, in, in, in Germany. Um, the workshops um, revealed three main issues for the parks. <clears throat> the first one was that as soon as the first lockdown ended, we had a significant increase of visitors. And in some parks, this was about 100% more compared to the visitors they had last year. So it was a significant increase. There is some data about from Google Mobility, but as it, it's very difficult to, to understand that because it compares with the winter season. And obviously in the winter, people don't move as much in Europe as they do in spring and the summer. Um, anyway, the other thing was that um, there was this new profile of visitors according to the management authorities that has come, people who were not wearing appropriate shoes, uh, you know, footwear. It was clear that these were people that had never visited um, some, you know, a national park. Um, also, we had an increase of responsible behavior, and I'm going to go into that in the next slide. And the last thing was that conflicts emerged between locals and visitors. Um, and the story was kind of picked up by the New York Times, like this is like a, the surge of new nature lovers in Europe is one of the challenges for Europe's park. And I've put down the link to one of the publications we have. In terms of responsible behavior, uh, Ben also mentions, uh, I think he, he mentioned similar issues. So for example, we had parking and traffic issues, there was increased traffic. There was a lot of activities that were not supposed to happen like illegal camping, a lot of littering, human and dog waste. That was a significant problem, especially when the facilities were closed at the beginning uh, of, of the lockdown. Uh, illegal barbecues and fires, uh, people not staying on the path, so trying to avoid others, they, they tended to go out of the path and then they caused even more damage to biodiversity. And then we had a lot of antisocial behavior. For example, a lot of rangers um, kind of had, you know, they, they had to take the role of the police, let's say, in a way, and, and instruct people to do this or that. So that caused a lot of tension. Um, now, I wanted to stay a little bit more on the conflicts between the locals and the visitors. Um, as, as I said, these parks, the, the people who live within these parks rely a lot on tourism. You know, the whole economy is based on these huge amounts of tourists that come in them. Uh, so COVID created the problem that um, without these visitors, you can't have, um, you know, the income you have, but on the other hand, they might be considered as transmitters of the virus. So local communities were very reluctant, let's say, for the reopening of the park. And we had incidents of vandalism and also placement of signs where basically people were saying, stay home, don't come and visit the parks. 
Um, now, to look a little bit more into what people thought, because this is what the management authorities were saying. So to look a little bit on the Snowdonia National Park, um, as I mentioned, it was an online survey and we had about uh, 700 people who um, filled in uh, the survey. So with the limitations that uh, an online survey has, obviously, because it's not a representative uh, sample um, to the extent we can have with a, with a, with a normal, let's say, survey. Um, it was interesting. So when we were asking people what was the impact of the lockdown, of the very strict lockdown, we could see that there were three um, aspects that were positive and were linked to visitors. So the positive things, positive things were that there were less visitors, that the cycling paths were less busy, and that the walking paths were less busy. So for me, COVID was a social experiment. So how will a national park look like if we removed completely the visitors during the lockdown period? And it looks like, at least in Snowdonia, people actually enjoyed this kind of um, quiet. But we have to say that people thought that this would last just for a few months and that soon the park will reopen again for everyone. Um, so when we asked people, what do you want to happen? Um, you know, do you want the park to reopen? That was back in May. We saw that a lot of people were very, very uh, reluctant, let's say, for this to happen. So they were very cautious. Um, to look on a different park, the Eiffel National Park in Germany, uh, Germany didn't have the restrictions of moving uh, so much uh, to nature, so people actually visited a lot the park. And again, here we see that um, it was considered negative by the locals, so in a negative way. So people thought that visitors were coming in, the cycle paths are too busy, the trails are too busy, we have an increase in visitors, this is negative for us. So it's a, it's a similar, um, uh, let's say, opinion, but on the, on the other um, side of things. And finally, the management tools that they tried to come up with the management authorities were targeted on overcrowding. So the closed facilities, they tried to stop advertising the park. Um, and then for responsible behavior, they tried to, to come up with new campaigns uh, to increase the number of rangers. That was the same for the conflicts and for the social distancing. They tried to ban social gathering, restrict the number of guided tools, uh, one-way systems on paths, and obviously have PPE for, for, for members of staff. So I would like to close my presentation by opening up into questions that maybe we can discuss in the Q&A, that perhaps COVID is an opportunity to reconsider the visitor capacity uh, in, in our national parks, that maybe it's time to rethink how many people um, are a, how much can is the current capacity of each park so that it's sustainable? And second, that if we do have this surge of new visitors, whether it is an opportunity to educate even more people who come into nature. Um, so I've put here um, the, the website of our project where all our publications are there and also my email if anyone would like to get in touch. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nicoletta. And those will be great questions to bring to the panel at the end. So I, I jotted those down. Okay, so for our final panelists today, we are going to have uh, Dr. Catherine Pickering from Australia talk about some of the impacts of COVID and bushfires in Australia. Professor Catherine Pickering is an outstanding academic who has conducted research in recreation ecology, protected area management, conservation, climate change, and literature review methodology. She's worked, done this work across 30 years and has over 280 publications, including more than 140 in international peer-reviewed academic journals. Her work has provided important insights into the environmental and social values of nature, including assessment, assessing impacts from recreation use of natural spaces, such as forests. This includes published key papers highlighting the relative impacts of popular recreational activities such as horse riding, mountain biking, and hiking, the impacts of, of recreation in Australia, as well as recent reviews of research globally on monitoring and ma the management of visitors to natural areas. Most recently, she and her team are examining how social media can be used to better understand where, when, and why people engage with nature and how to better promote conservation in a changing climate. Currently, Dr. Pickering is a professor of environment at Griffith University in Australia and is head of discipline for ecology and evolution. She's also received national and international awards, including for her research supervision of doctoral students. 
So I'll turn it over to you, Catherine. Hello, and thank you very much. It's fantastic uh, to be here. And um, I'm really uh, pleased to have the chance to, from Australia, um, present uh, perspectives. And in doing that, I'll start sharing my screen. So as we know, I'll just fix the technical stuff. So hopefully everyone can see that. Um, so what I'm talking about uh, is partly COVID. But Catherine, I'm also... sorry to interrupt you. I don't think your screen sharing is working at the moment. Okay, sorry about that. Oh, no, it's okay. Can people see it now? Yes, we're good. We can see your presentation. It's not in slideshow mode, but we can see see that screen. There we go. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. <laughs> okay, hope this works for everyone. So as I mentioned, I'm going to talk a little bit about COVID, but I'm also going to talk a little bit about wildfire and its impacts, because uh, within that concept of resilience, these are two examples of natural disturbance that have really important impacts for recreation systems with some similarities, but also some really important differences. Um, I'd first, of course, like to start by acknowledging um, welcome to country and in doing so acknowledge the traditional custodians, the land on which uh, we're meeting. So in Oregon, in Europe and also in Australia and particularly on the Gold Coast where I am. And I'd like to pay respects to elders past, present and emerging. Um, very aware uh, in terms of things like fire, the incredibly important role of uh, Indigenous communities. Uh, in their role of managing fire, particularly in Australia in the past. So the big thing about this is around natural disasters. And the issue with it is that what we've got is that um, both, what nat both COVID, as I mentioned, and wildfires have these characteristics that what you get is um, a rapid large scale changes in human activities. And in the context that we're talking about is human activities of people participating in recreation. With wildfire, you also, of course, have an impact on the natural environment. So you have these similarities that people aren't accessing parks or are accessing parks, and there's a difference in the way they're doing it. But with wildfire, you're also changing the environment, where with COVID, so to speak, um, it's the removal of humans that might be causing the change, but not in and such the COVID itself causing a change. So what happens with these factors? So first of all, uh, like uh, presenting about Europe, a little bit of background about uh, the recreation systems in Australia. So we have a, a, a large number of protected areas and most of them are what are called IUCN category one to five. And in fact, most uh, the largest area of them is national parks. And so unlike the situation in Europe, uh, most of them don't have resident populations, people living in them. Uh, and uh, so, it, and in that sense, they're more like some parks in the US where, so to speak, wild lands. Uh, is the case. Um, there's, of course, some issue around that because, of course, there was a large Indigenous community in Australia prior to colonisation uh, and by Europeans, and then that resulting in displacement. So it, there's a lot of discussion in Australia about naturalness of those landscapes. Um, there's 62 million hectares, about 8% of Australia, and they include many globally renowned world heritage areas that people may be familiar with, such as Uluru, the Great Barrier Reef as a marine park, but with also terrestrial components to it with the islands, Kakadu, Blue Mountains, etc. And the parks are really, really popular with Australians, but also with international visitors. And I'm going to reflect on this some more later um, about the impact of not having international visitors. So as uh, people are likely to be aware, because it was covered very extensively in the news, is that in 2019-20, our summer, we had what's called the Black Summer. And this was extreme fire events after a series of very hot, dry years. And we have a forest fire index uh, in Australia, and the scale of that was unprecedented in the risk factor for fires. Um, and the conditions were uh, 
had not been experienced at that level and at that level over so much of Australia. And so around 18 million hectares burnt and about 80% of Australians were either directly or indirectly affected. Um, directly by fires, by evacuations um, in risk of fire, but also indirectly via things like smoke. So we had uh, our major cities uh, became um, smoke covered and with health effects around that. Um, at very sadly and horrifically, 34 people were killed, um, about 2,000 700 homes burnt and the total cost of these fires have been massive uh, and part of that was its impact on tourism and part of that was then impact on nature-based tourism. Now as I mentioned one of the things about fires is it has environmental impacts and that is very obvious this, this very unprecedented scale of the fires. Um, so that affected large extensive ecosystems, soils, waterways, as I mentioned, air quality. The estimate was uh, at the time that over a billion animals were killed, uh, three billion vertebrates displaced, and what coal, uh, was a lot of coverage on in the media uh, was about koalas, uh, and with about 8,000 koalas killed. Um, the habitat of many endangered species were affected, um, and down the bottom, I've got two graphs from uh, Isabel Smith, who is an honor student who worked with me last year. And uh, we're in the process of writing this work up for publication, call out to Isabel for her fantastic research. Um, in my own area in Southeast Queensland, where we are, what she looked at was the effect on endangered species. And the bottom left is an example of an endangered species of eucalypt, where dark green is the total coverage known uh, uh, predicted habitat, and red is the area of that predicted habitat that burnt. Uh, on the bottom right, she was looking at how much of different vegetation communities burnt. And the really scary thing about these fires is the dark green ones on the left are actually rainforest communities and the purple one on the far right is wetlands. So we had large areas of rainforest that are um, considered previously unlikely to burn and poorly adapted burn. And that reflects this unprecedented nature of the fires. Now the wildfires and tourism in parks. Well, all parks closed in many regions, both uh, as the fire risk went up um, obviously, when fires were burning in the parks. Um, in southeast Queensland, Isabel found that 24% of the area of national parks in the region burnt. And you can see again uh, the top right is a bar graph showing um, in red what percentage of each of these national parks burnt and their total area. And as you can see, there is quite large national parks had quite massive areas that actually burnt. Now, the parks were closed not only during the fires, but also for a long time after. And in fact, there are some areas of parks that are still closed. Um, and this is because, of course, there is loss and damage to infrastructure for tourism, roads, visitor centres, shelters, trails, bridges, lookouts, etc. There are also safety issues, risk of landslides, tree fall, flooding and other events post fire. There's very obviously the environmental impacts that I talked about. And there are also limited resources. So the costs of fighting fire, repairing facilities, resources, uh, restora any restoration activities, et cetera, uh, is a big pull on um, park funding. Uh, and one of the things about it is tourists, although um, generally the fires were uh, um, due to, uh, started by lightning and certainly the environmental conditions were created by climate change, um, we've also had examples more recently of the scale in which tourists can actually cause fires and very, uh, an area of World Heritage Area on Fraser Island, which is one of the national parks here, that didn't actually massively burn. Originally, it had some fire in, two, in 2019. Just this summer, uh, um, a huge area of it burnt started by some campers who didn't put out the illegal campfire. So there's obvious impacts on recreation that happen with the fire and they are ongoing in areas around our capacity to access those parks and what those parks look like as the restoration, as some of them recover, but also some of them are transitioning. 
And there are a whole lot of issues around that. With COVID, it, you know, we would just be talking about fires now because that was the huge thing that happened in Australia that caused a huge amount of displacement, grief, stress, etc. That was the issue that was on our minds until, of course, late January and last year when COVID uh, erupted. So what we've got on the um, diagram here is actually data very recent from about two days ago that's put out by our Australian government. And what it is is to show that the current status of confirmed cases and the reporting. And so you can see that we've basically had two waves, the original early wave in March and then a second wave in July, August. Now that second wave was only uh, basically in Victoria um, rather than much of the rest of the country. And that resulted in very different um, lockdown impacts and effects in the different parts. But currently we're incredibly proud of the fact that we have only 115 active cases and we have um, no cases in the country in intensive care. And uh, the current case, um, in the last couple of days, I think we've had no community transmission. Um, we call them double donut days here or donut days, which is zeros where we have no community transmission and no deaths. Uh, and it's a total of 909 deaths. And that's out of uh, a population of about uh, uh, 26 million. Uh, 500,000. Now, we had a very strong rapid evidence-based response, and this has resulted in a few cases that uh, um, particularly started off with closing borders, and that is international borders. And in fact, a major issue is that they are still restricted access to Australia. So anyone coming to Australia, if they can get on a plane and pay for a very expensive flights that are coming the limited seating that's in them, have to go into 14 days mandatory quarantine in hotels managed by the government. Uh, there have also been uh, national in March and then more recently uh, in um, July and August, local lockdowns by states and even by regions of hotspots uh, in response to cases. We've had highly effective contact tracing, which is a major mechanism that's been done of actually tracking down everyone, somebody who's had COVID has been in contact with, uh, while they may be infectious, but also during the period where they may have picked up the infection. And you can see uh, on the bottom mid right, that's why there's a diagram that's cases by source of infection. It's actually working out how many are uh, people who are in quarantine in the, um, uh, the fixed quarantine as people who come into Australia, how many are locally acquired uh, and where they're under investigation. We've also had um, free COVID testing um, and you can see there the massive uh, number of uh, bottom left has got the number of COVID tests and it's over 12 million COVID tests. Um, I've had a test, most people have had tests you line up at uh, the testing centre um, and it'll happen. Um, and there's also been government support, support for business and wage subsidies, the program's called JobKeeper to keep, uh, where the government paid companies to pay employees to stay connected during lockdown and JobSeeker to increase the funding for people in what would have been unemployment benefits and a range of others. So the upshot of it is to try and say that we have uh, act, COVID has had an effect in Australia, but it's not been on the scale um, in other countries. And we're very aware that uh, how lucky we have been and how, um, but also aware of the massive impact that it's had on our compassion and sympathy um, to people being affected. Now, the effect on tourism, well, basically there's no international tourism. So normally in, uh, we would have 9.5 million arrivals per year. And as uh, I mentioned, there was a lot of people of those international arrivals, visitors go to national parks. So about 16% of all visitation to national parks are international. And to give you an idea of that scale in the latest data I can get was uh, November, 2020, there were 7,500 people came to Australia and that's, that's mostly Australians coming home. Um, 
there's also still reduced domestic tourism. So the bottom diagram, the darker green is number of overnight trips and the lighter green is the spend. And as you can see, it very obviously collapsed uh, associated with the lockdowns that we mentioned, but it's still um, lower than it was. Um, this was the most recent data I could get uh, nationally about um, tourism. So what about visiting Australian parks? Well, it's complicated. Um, there is some uh, surveys that are being done in parks, but getting access to that data, uh, we're still in the process of doing that. But I've got some information here to highlight some of what we've found. Uh, so mobility trends, the Apple monthly data, as you can see, very obviously the dramatic impact in April of the lockdown. And you can see that the public transport still down, but in the um, orangey colour is walking and you can still see that that is down. You can see it came back up as people started to be able to move around after the initial lockdown, but it's still got some effects and you can see that we had another spike lockdown in Sydney and Vic, uh, in Brisbane and New South Wales and Victoria. And you can see that pull down that happened in there. On the top right is this data that uh, Google made available. And I've put up the dark green is Australia and the um, brown is the United Kingdom and the dark blackie is the United States. And as uh, has already been mentioned, one of the problems is that this data is uh, compared to uh, six weeks prior to the outbreak of COVID. So one of the difficulties is it has a very strong seasonality. And so the issue is we don't have the data um, without the seasonal effects. So how much of that spike in there is associated with COVID or seasonality? What you've already heard is some much better data about park visitation more directly. Um, now for Australia, you'll notice there's no big peak, but there's also no peak uh, so to speak in January, uh, which is February and over our summer. Now, one of the reasons we've got an issue with this data is uh, with people, are people going to parks or not? First of all, we've lost 16% of the park visitors, which are the international visitors. Also January, February is when we were in the middle of bushfires and people weren't going to national parks. So our base data is not there. Um, so it, the answer is don't know about this data, but down the bottom right, you can see that as has happened elsewhere, there are restrictions on access to national parks, and that is to make them compliant with government policies in each of the states uh, around, it, around access. And they've had, for example, we've just had the um, major summer holidays and things like there've been restrictions on camping, the density of people camping, uh, things like that. So there are impacts that the parks have had. A slight difference is that because we've had less hard lockdown, there's been less effect on having park staff being able to go out into the parks. So what there has been is more intensive cleaning, removal of rubbish, toilet blocks, etc. But that's actually not so much in some cases to deal with the problem, that's to make them COVID compliant. So what it means is that the, they're out there cleaning the toilets where they might have done it once a week before because of COVID, they might be doing it every day to make them clean as opposed it, COVID clean as opposed to response to um, higher use per se. There has been some discussion about urban parks, but uh, we were talking to some colleagues in Victoria where there's the biggest impact of the lockdown and we haven't seen what's happened. There hasn't got clear data for that. So just very quickly um, talk about what uh, I mentioned we do work on social media. So we have an ongoing project where we're monitoring Twitter globally for discussions about national parks. And this is what do people say on Twitter and who talked on Twitter about national parks in April, 2020. And so we monitored 163,000 tweets sent by 118,000 accounts from 204 different countries and territories, but mostly it was the USA. So 27% of, of tweets. And one, the bottom left is showing you um, the uh, number of negative and positive comments. And you can see that generally people are actually, uh, this is where people are from, not where the park is. So people from Mexico really talked incredibly positively uh, about parks. For some reason, the French weren't so positive when they talked about national parks. Um, the top 
right is showing you how much of that conversation explicitly talked about terms for the COVID virus and terms associated with lockdown. Um, and you can see that, and this is where people are from. So it's not people visiting parks necessarily, it's people talking about the park. So people's, what's the public discourse about them? Uh, and you can see that there's quite different uh, percentages of where people are from for how much the conversation was driven about. Um, how much of the conversation about national parks related to these issues of COVID and lockdown. Uh, so just finally, this is to, about which parks were talked about and mainly they were Yosemite, Yellowstone, uh, overwhelming, like 13% of the conversations were about Yosemite, then Yellowstone, Grand Canyon, Joshua Tree, Great Smoky Mountain, Zion, Grand Teton. So in the top 40 parks discussed in Twitter, um, it's very much those American parks, but other famous parks such as Kruger, Nairobi, Banff, et cetera. Um, you can also see how much of that bio, how much of that conversation about a particular park talked about COVID or lockdown varied. So Grand Canyon, it was 64, nearly 65% of the discourse of people talking about it talked about COVID, whereas it dropped off to less than 5% for Yellowstone which was the one that was talked about the most. Um, so very little of the conversation about Yellowstone related to it. Grand Teton, Joshua, et cetera, was less. Um, we also looked at the average uh, sentiment, the emotions that people, and compared it to some long-term park data to see. And as you can see, there was an association. So if a park, if people talked about park positively before COVID, they still were likely to talk about it. But for particular parks, it changed a lot. And this is uh, preliminary data that we're still exploring at the moment. So just finally, thank you very much um, uh, for that. Uh, as mentioned, uh, I also just a plug, I do um, uh, research in research methods uh, and that material on how to do a particular method of systematic quantitative lit reviews, there's a website and just directing people there. And there's an example of how we've used that that may be relevant uh, to people here, which is, um, a review of the current knowledge and future directions for monitoring managing visitors. And thank you very much. Thank you so much, Catherine. Um, so we have some time for, for questions. And I'm going to start with a question for Catherine while the other panelists can turn on their cameras and get their audio on. So Catherine, there's a question that came in about the response uh, after the bushfires. So in a not Anonymous attendees asking, after the bushfires in certain areas, did tourism see an increase in visitors who wanted to look at the devastation of the bushfires, or has visitation decreased in those areas because of the bushfires? Um, in general, visitation decreased, but uh, it's more this summer that um, people, well, it's more this summer we would have expected people to go back into the parks to see the recovery, and there is some uh, where the fires went through vegetation types such as some of the eucalypt forests that are adapted to fire they are recovering but COVID came in over the top so if the fires finished in late January and COVID started to have an impact in Australia in February and lockdowns in March so it, it it's um uh it's been in a very interesting two years Great, thank you. So I'm gonna, um, we have a fair number of questions. I'm gonna jump to one for the panelists as a whole um, so that everyone can have a chance to have some input. So Katie Kavanaugh asks for the whole panel, are you able to assess the impact of COVID on ch children? Anecdotally, Katie saw several instances where children were in a less structured school environment and needed to balance the sedentary screen time. Um, and so parents were taking their children out hiking, visiting to parks. And kind of a follow-up question, is there any relationship between recreating as a child and lifelong affinity for outdoor recreation? So kind of two parts there. Can we, does anyone want to talk about how COVID impacts children? And then the second part of that question was that connection between recreation as a child and, and lifelong commitments to that activity. And anyone's welcome to, to take that. I'll step in quickly on the second part, which is there is a lot of research which shows that um, ch children exposed to nature uh, have a much longer commitment to conservation and that's measured in park visitation, but it's also in voting patterns and donations to 
to conservation organizations, etc. So one of the reasons I know, for example, the Starker family themselves and many of us have a very strong focus on environmental education with children and those opportunities is because we know that that's one of the most beneficial things we can do for conservation in the long term. Thanks. Any other thoughts on that? Just jump in briefly. Um, the, the data that I've cited around uh, Oregon outdoor recreation participation rates does show um, very high rates among families with, with small children, but we of course don't survey uh, folks under 18 directly, nor do we track their past sales um, or their cell phones or you know um, social media use, the other sort of research mechanisms. Um, and just while that's all anecdotal, uh, I will say that one thing that I've seen that's encouraging both in Oregon and across the country is a bit more interest in outdoor preschools, um, part, partly because of the safety considerations during COVID, but there's uh, something of a trend for uh, getting kids engaged in a, at a really young age in that sort of no infrastructure required outdoor preschool setting. Uh, Kaylin, while, while you're, we're unmuted, there's a question directed at you about the hunting and fishing interest that you talked about in Oregon. Um, so Daniel Powers says, um, is there any additional data that might suggest a reason or reasons? And they're asking as someone who got into hunting and fishing last summer after COVID lockdown. So are there any, do we know why we saw such big increases in hunting and fishing, hunting and fishing interests in Oregon? Uh, so there is a little bit of, uh, additional demographic info that's been shared with me from ODFW that I'd have to, to pull up separately. Um, but as I understand it from uh, ODFW folks sort of tra translating their data, one could be a function of the new online licensing uh, program that we have. Uh, a big portion of those license sales were, were not in fact folks entirely new to hunting and fishing, but instead folks who had a greater than one year gap in their hunting and fishing license purchasing pattern. So folks are sort of returning to the activity. And then um, I guess it would just be my opinion that those types of activities like hunting and fishing or hiking or cross country skiing that are sort of naturally predisposed to being good social distancing activities, um, we, we saw a bump in those sorts of things uh, essentially across the board. Now, of course, the work um, is how to, you know, continue recruiting and retaining those folks so that they continue their participation sort of post pandemic. I think that's probably as much as I can say on that one. Great, thank you. Uh, so a question just came in that's asking about trail characteristics or designs of trail systems. So is there any research on the design characteristics of trails or trail systems that can absorb increases in traffic without impacting the user experience? And this is from Ryan and he says, I'm guessing, or they say, I'm guessing the direction loop trails would be the most resilient in surges of use as well as in populations over time. So I'm not sure if anyone wants to talk about ways we can design or facilitate trail systems to better accommodate the increases in use that we may be seeing post COVID. Can I jump in on that one? Um, <clears throat> from what we've seen in Europe, uh, one of the things that some parks are trying to do is to keep the same number of visitors, but track um, where the, how they spread, um, you know, across space. So basically they're trying to encourage people to use all of the area, because what happens is people just go like one kilometer from the park, from the parking <laughs> that they have parked. So they're trying to encourage people to, to spread. So I don't think, I mean, other people on the panel will probably know more, but um, in Europe, at least we, we haven't developed anything so sophisticated to be able to, as far as I know, to kind of manage in a specific way the trails but I think there is a lot of um, there are a lot of discussions that um, we need to think carefully about the spatial planning in the parks. Um, just stepping in there, there's a lot of research, uh, and particularly out of the USA, by some colleagues that have done some really great work 
uh, Chris Mons um, and a whole lot of others in that group, uh, amongst others there, around the design of trails. And there's some really good um, programs about how to harden trails to deal with different levels of use. But one of the things that is really interesting is around how you deal with temporal pattern changes of low. So traditionally, we've always had this thing that you have lots of days where there's very low visitation. So if it's an urban park, it's during the week. Uh, sorry, it, you know, where, where the park is, et cetera, you get these differential patterns, public holidays, your usage peaks. Um, so some of those, of course, are going that you, uh, Nicoletta was mentioning about things like single direction trails temporarily. Um, some cases there are ticketing or um, other programs. Others are active education to displace people temporarily. So encourage people maybe earlier in the day and later in the day rather than the peak of the day uh, around those sort of programs. So there's things that you can do structurally with the design of the trails and things you can do um, behaviorally with encouraging um, some of that use uh, component. But I do think that one of the effects is that the COVID amplified was very, very hot spot intense uses, uh, Nicola mentioned, around the entrance to parks, the how the people were going short distances. And in fact, car parking became a major issue um, with that, that I think for a lot of places. Great, thanks. So there was um, a question about, Nicoletta, I think this was in relation to your presentation from Rad Bean. Um, whether this should be a quick one, I think, how does the 30% plan apply to the UK since the UK is pulled out of the EU in terms of the 30%? Just as an aside, President um, Biden has also signed something, an executive order similar in the US, so 30% land and 30% water by 2030. So if you could speak a little bit about how that's gonna work in the UK, that'd be great. Yeah, okay, so just to say that uh, in general, I'm a very optimistic person. So my, the UK has no obligation to follow this kind of um, strategy. Uh, but what I hope is going to happen is we're going to have a, a competition between the UK and the EU on who is going to be greener. <laughs> so maybe, maybe that will benefit both uh, but yeah the, the uk has no uh, yeah the, the, it's it's clear that they're out of the eu now so great thank you and ben i'm gonna have a question you answered it in the chat but i think it was a really good one so more than you can speak to it a little bit more to the to the group as a whole um about anything that you and anyone else in the panel is welcome to jump into, um, you know that during the pandemic many people choose to stay closer to home and found new areas to recreate is there anything indicating that these people will revert back to recreating in areas a little further away from home or to continue to recreate closer to their home in newfound locations? And again, that question was directed to Ben, but I feel like it's applicable across all the panelists. So anyone's welcome to, to jump in after Ben. Yeah, I mean, our data showed that over that nine week period, people were starting to travel further from home. Um, I think there was a sense of people feeling safe in their own community, but as soon as they left the boundaries of their community. There was a lot of uncertainty. And so I think we're going to see two things. One is those active outdoor enthusiasts that are seeking a certain type of experience, I think they're going to continue to venture further afield, you know, as this thing continues, as this COVID continues to evolve. On the flip side of that, though, there are a lot of people who now have found these newfound recreational resources close to home. You know, it's more time efficient, it's more energy efficient, you don't have to drive, maybe you walk out your door and you can go for a hike around your neighborhood. So I think we may see a blend of that. But again, our sample was not nationally representative. So I can only speak to uh, how it represented people that are really active outdoor enthusiasts. And with that particular population, my prediction would be that they would continue to get back to those normal recreation patterns of, of seeking opportunities further afield, so to speak. Any other thoughts on that? Um, just uh, reflecting back also to the earlier question, uh, one of the things that we know that um, is exposure to nature and exposure to you know, a local park or things, this thing of new people going to parks who haven't been before, we know that it, as soon as the park gets into your mind map, you know it's there, then you are more likely to revisit it, you know about the facilities. So we do think that there will be some continuing 
uh, greater use of local parks and local areas, even when more opportunities come, people will start to go out, but compared to pre-COVID, they may stay. But the other thing about the that is that we're finding, and there's been some interesting sort of uh, anecdotal discussion around a change in values. And I think that's a really important thing that more generally, uh, and there's some broader other research about people have become more environmentally aware. So one of the things that's really weird in previous recessions, people become less environmental aware, aware because of the cost factor. Now people are becoming more environmentally aware, more concerned about issues like climate change, even though COVID is occurring. People are more concerned about wanting uh, about value. So with the children, people are moving more to wanting to do old fashioned activities with the children to spend time with them. So we may actually see children ending up having more um, as people are allowed out of houses, the values for children will change, but the values for communities are changing. And I think that's a really important thing that's going to have an effect over all of our societies, including protected areas and recreation. Great, thank you. We're right at two o'clock. I do want to be respectful of folks' time, but I did really like Nicoletta's question in her last slide. So I'm going to pose that quickly to the panel and then we'll, we'll wrap up. But um, what opportunities do we see in terms of outdoor recreation, opportunities either to consider capacity or others that you see that can come out of these disturbances and disasters that have happened over the past year? Um, if I can just follow up uh, from what um, Catherine said, I think, because I have been asked the same question, and I wanted to ask the same question to the panel, <laughs> you know, if, if this trend of new visitors is going to stay with us, and I, I mean, I'm Greek, and I had the same question from some Greek students uh, last week, and they were very pessimistic. They thought, oh, you know, the Greeks will just go back to their usual behavior after the pandemic. I, I think that, as Catherine said, the lesson here is that this is an opportunity. New people have come into the parks. It's our job as uh, researchers, scientists, practitioners to keep them connected to nature. You know, this was a unique year for everyone. So I think it's an opportunity and not, we should not see it as something completely negative. Any other final thoughts before we wrap up? Yeah, I, I would add that um, in my time with Leaving No Trace, which has been quite a long time at this point, uh, this may represent one of the greatest opportunities to promote sustainable and responsible enjoyment of the outdoors that we've ever had. Um, there are so many people coming to the outdoors for the, all the benefits that it offers. And in some ways it's a substitute for other leisure activities, but the opportunity that we have to bring those people into the fold, to learn about parks and protected areas, to begin to develop their own personal connection to these places. In my view, that's a good thing. So we're looking at the, the silver lining for sure um, in terms of an opportunity to um, educate a whole lot of new people about these wonderful resources that we have that we can share, but that we also have a duty to take care of because there are more and more of us trying to enjoy the same finite spaces. If we don't do that in a way that leaves uh, the least amount of impact, then we're not setting ourselves up for a very sustainable recreation future. So we're absolutely harnessing the power of this particular time, uh, knowing that we're able to reach a whole lot of people, which is a good thing. Well, I'll just build on that very briefly. Nicoletta's um, sort of spirit of welcoming and, and Ben's educational themes both resonate to me and our, our strategies that I see in play in Oregon, and, and I'll just reinforce kind of the other pieces on my closing slide, which is sort of good news on the funding front, both at the local level, state level, and federal level. I think you'll continue to see momentum um, build and investments even as we recover, because folks understand just how important access to the outdoors has been over the last year and, and will be moving forward. And then that um, kind of notion of all lands collaborative recreation management, I, I see building a lot of momentum, at least here as well. Great. 
Well, I'm sorry to those of you who put in questions that we did not get to, um, but I want to thank all of our panelists. Again, this is the time when everyone would clap for you, but I'll, I'll clap for you myself here. <laughs> and I really appreciate your, your time and putting the presentations and all of the great responses to the questions. Um, and thank you to the attendees today. I did want to just give a reminder to please join us on Wednesday, February 10th at 2 p.m. Pacific time for our next lecture which will feature the topic of education. We'll hear from the Oregon Department of Education, OFRI and the College of Forestry about the impacts of COVID on students. We will discuss the various stages of K through 16 education through to employment. And the lecture will explore how K to 12 education is impacted in terms of outdoor school and the other natural resource education programs like the ones OFRI provides, CTE, trade school and workforce. We'll then take a look at how current students, both at the community college and university level, are recruited and taught in a virtual world and what new opportunities we have with online education. So thank you, everybody, and I hope you have a good rest of your day and a great rest of the week.